I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. Let's pray before we do anything else. Father, I thank you for this time today. I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you for our partners that are with us today and watching today. I give you praise and honor, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a good time on the 11th hour today. The Lord is talking to us about a lot of things, and, and um, we want to, I want to continue on this. Uh, just some things the Lord has just, you know, Austin said something to me uh, today, and I don't, I don't know that I told him about this Sunday, but Sunday at Church International, when I came out of my office, the time, something was being messed with in the time, in the spirit. And I came out, and, and there was some, uh, some of our team standing out there, and I said, something's going on with the time. And I said, time has changed today. Something changed last Sunday. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but then I walk out here, and before we came back to me here and Austin said, a, a Sunday marked time. Well, he's absolutely right. Something happened. And um, it was, you could really even almost feel it Sunday. Now, we walk in it by faith now because we, we don't understand what's happened. But the Lord will show us as we go. So today, I, uh, this is what the Lord has placed on my heart to, to talk to you about. We're in the time of prophets. We're in the time of prophecy, great prophecy being fulfilled. And why are the prophets so bold to speak? What's in their thinking? And today I want to, I want to, to look at some insights to the ministry and mindset of the prophet. You know, those who attempted to seize the prophet's ministry, this was not too long ago, by trying to make them sign a paper that said basically that their prophecies would have to be ran by them first before they could be released after the, the, the election took place because they had no insight to see what happened. I hope to God this was ignorance because you came against the prophets and hindered God in the earth when that happened. Some of the prophets, you may have derailed enough they can't get back. So I want to ask these questions first before we get into this. Here's a question. Do you know the call of a prophet or is that call measured by your definition of a prophet? Speaking to those who demanded the prophet sign something and agree to, to, uh, to, in other words, let them be God over their prophecies, not God. Prophets are servants of the Lord. Now, here's another question. Do you know how a prophet thinks? Or do you seek to control how they think? Here's a question. Do you even understand the role of a prophet? Or are you seeking to define the role of a prophet? By all of this, we have to vet your prophecies. Here's a question. Vet our prophecies. Hmm. Are you afraid, like the Sanhedrin of Jesus' day, that if you let the prophets continue unchecked, that the government will take away your 501c3? Jesus never let the Sanhedrin vet his prophecies. Neither did John the Baptist, and neither did any of the Old Testament prophets. Those who attempted to seize the prophet's ministry by trying to make them sign a paper that said basically that their prophecies would have to be ran by them first. As I said, I hope to God it was in ignorance because you came against the prophets and hindered God in the earth. 
It's obvious that you don't know what time it is. And a lot of people don't know what time it is in the prophetic. Oh, well, you know, you said, uh, the prophets said, talking about all the prophets, that Donald Trump would win the election. He did. But what you mean by that is that he, God should have taken him, picked him up, and crammed him in that office, whether anybody else liked it or not. You get all of that from the mindset that God is in control and men have nothing to say about what happens here. That's where you get that from. You cannot live in a prophetic life and understand the prophet's ministry or the prophetic that runs through the scripture with that kind of mindset. But for one simple reason, you didn't get saved until you decided to get saved. God didn't just pick you up and make you get saved. Even though the scripture says it's his will that none should perish, but that all should have eternal life. But you didn't have it until you decided to. He didn't make you do anything. It's just like in the time of, of Saul and David. We were in the time of two kings. But how, how do you see that if you, if you want to judge all prophecies by your idea of a prophet? As if God can't do anything without he tells you. Or he can't do anything outside of your doctrine. Has it ever dawned on you that maybe your doctrine is wrong? Uh, that probably didn't go over. It never goes over. But it's not meant to be a criticism. It's meant to be constructive so that we can move forward. And if the Lord is correcting, then let him correct. We were in the time of two kings. It's just like the time of David and Saul. Saul, the prophetic line and, and, and the way the prophetic moves through the scripture, Saul had to be the first king because of Jacob's prophecy over Benjamin. When Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin, she prophesied and was going to call him Benoni, son of pain. But Jacob, being a prophet, he wasn't going to prophesy out of the anguish and pain of his soul watching his beloved leave. He knew that that destiny had to be shaped by something bigger than the anguish of a soul. So he rose above it and he said, no, his name will be Benjamin, son of the right hand, son of the south. One uh, part of a translation says, happy son. And one uh, talked about the, the, the son of the right hand because of, its, of his strength, the son of his power. The right hand could denote him leaning on Benjamin and leaning on something and him because they said one, I think it was a rabbinical translation or a rabbinical commentary on it said that he was, that he called him that so he would help us get through this time of losing Rachel. But when he did that, he called him son of the south. He was the only one born in the promised land. And he said he would be the strength, the power, the, what he would lean on. So the first king of Israel had to be from Benjamin. But it denoted temporary. And then when Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so then when Saul became king, it was only temporary. Because Saul began to disobey. He began to go rogue. He began to defy the prophet Samuel. And Samuel came to him and Samuel said, Today your kingdom is taken from you and given to a neighbor that's better than you. And so Saul said, lunged to grab Samuel's robe and tore the robe. And Samuel said, Just as you've torn my, my robe today, my mantle, said, So your kingdom has been torn from your hands and given to someone else. Today, not 14 years from now. So David won the election that day. In other words, he was appointed that day to be the king. The kingdom was transferred to him. But Saul didn't get up and just say, well, I submit. A time of two kings was in the earth. 
And Saul chased David round and round and round and round. But David had to become the king at some point because when Joseph had Benjamin standing in front of him in Egypt, he said, I'm going to keep the boy here. And Judah stepped up and said, no, let me be his substitute. Take me instead. And from that point on, it was determined. Whatever happened to Benjamin because of Jacob's blessing in the promised land, whatever happened to Benjamin would usher in a time. And Judah became the substitute for Benjamin. And David was from the tribe of Judah. And so David went in to be king. But not that day, but the day the kingdom was given to him. You can't deny that in the scripture. Don't add words and say eventually it would be the kingdom. No, he said today it's his. So there was Saul, a bogus king, on a throne with no kingdom. David with a kingdom and no throne. So the Lord told Samuel, fill your horn with oil. And the prophet carried the anointing to be king. And the Holy Ghost was going to follow that oil. And he went to David and poured it on David's head. And it said, when that day the Spirit of the Lord came on David, it left Saul. And Saul chased David and tried to indict him, so to speak, for years and years and years. But it had already been anointed and prophesied. So we, you think prophets missed it in 2020. You know, it's amazing to me that prophets can hit it on so much huge things. And then suddenly you think, oh, they didn't get it on there. That's because you are in the mindset that God is in control no matter what you do. That's why you think that. You think, God, well, God is in control. No matter what we do, he's going to do what he wants to do. But you didn't get saved until your old mean self decided you wanted to. Then you got saved. We are co-laborers with God. And there is a devil in the earth. And he's walking to and fro in the earth. He's looking for someone he can devour. And what he's doing is he's trying to hinder the prophetic move of God. But eventually it has to happen and we've just been in a war since 2020 and the prophets speak and the prophets talk and they say well God didn't just throw him in office so your prophecies must be wrong no your understanding of prophecy is wrong you know, prophecy teachers are wonderful. There are so many powerful prophecy teachers, and some I can call by name, but I just keep calling names that I like to listen to that know more about prophecy in the Scripture than anybody I've ever heard. But I never hear any of them consult a prophet for the intent of God's heart. They understand the prophecy, but not the intent of his heart like Benjamin and so forth. If you could, if you ever got those two together, so Satan knows he has to keep those apart because it won't just be the written word. It will be the written word coupled with the man after his own heart that can hear the heart of God. And all of a sudden, man, the full picture and the intent of the word is known. And that's what we have to, to look at. Now, today I want to look at uh, the well, how a prophet thinks, um, things like that, uh, the mindset of a prophet, why they're so bold to speak, what is in their thinking, insights to the ministry and the mindset of the prophet. Now, let's go over to Revelation chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 1. We want to start there. Revelation 11, and I want to start looking at verse 1. Now, this is a time to come. This is a, um, this has not happened yet, but it does give you a lot of insight. Watch this. And there was given me a reed like a rod unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not 
For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city uh, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, these are two prophets, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed or slaughtered, the translation says. These have power to shut heaven, <coughs> that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Isn't that something? And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. It gives you an idea of what the earth thinks of prophets and the secular world and nations, the heads of nations. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now even though this time is yet to come, we can see what is in the time of prophets. And that's what I want to look at. What is in the time of prophets? Now the story I told you hasn't happened yet. But you can see what's in the time of prophets when prophets are spotlighted. What is in the time of prophets, their mindset, and what, they are used, uh, what they're used for in the end times? We are revealed the time of the prophets in these passages. The time of the prophets is the time of measuring. Did you notice that? In the very first uh, verse it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood up, saying, Rise and measure the temple and the altar, and them that worship therein. It's a time of measuring. Measuring three things. The temple of God. The altar. And them that worship in it. It is a time that those with no covenant with God. Will be given the court without the temple. It says that. And they'll trample underfoot the holy city. The Gentiles. Those without a covenant. So we see that it's a time that, that those with no covenant will be given the court without the temple. Now we can see this in the natural. We see this also in the court. Now, those with no covenant with God are desecrating the courts. Look at what they're doing to the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. If, it's, if it is not glaring to everyone that they're trying to destroy him by bankrupting him, then you're not looking. The love of money is the root of all evil, and this is what they're using to try and destroy him with. But it will not work. So the time frame, but it is the time of measuring. The time frame during the time of the prophets is three and a half years. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, prophets are here a lot longer than three and a half years, but there's something about this three and a half years the enemy fights for. Think on this. Three and one half years is a time frame Satan wants so badly that he would do anything to get it. It is a time of measuring, as we said. We'll get into that later. Time of measuring. Number one, measuring the temple of God. Now, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says the scripture declares that we are the temple of the living God. So during the time of the prophets, it's a time of measuring. To measure the temple means to judge according to any rule or standard. The reed used to measure or judge the temple of the living God is the word of God. Living holy, 
not embracing abominations, not being the salt of the earth. It is a time to measure out what the temple has coming to it. So you're in the time when the temple is being meted out what it has coming to it. It's the time of measuring. The next thing is to be measured is the altar. To measure the altar, this has to do with sacrifice. What is placed on the altar? It is a holy place. It is to be measured. And then thirdly, them that worship therein. To measure them that worship, it actually means this. To kiss the hand towards uh, to one in a token of reverence. Among the Orientals, especially the Persians, to fall upon the knees and touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. In the New Testament, by kneeling or prostration to do homage to one or make obeisance, whether in order to express respect or to make supplication. It's talking about worshiping God. It's to be measured your worship. How much do you worship? What do you come to church for? Are you ashamed to kneel before God? Do you worship God? Would you kiss the hand of God? Not a pope, God. Would you, where is your worship? Because the, you have to remember, that's what's being measured. That's being measured at this time. Three things are being measured. The temple of God, that's you. The altar of God, your, your sacrifice and your worship to God. All of this we find in Revelation chapter 11 in the first few verses. The time of the prophets is a time of measuring. But here's something that ought to really be glaring to us. And we should take notice of this. It doesn't mean the time to measure those without a covenant. He said, don't measure the outside. It's only measuring those who have a covenant with God. During the time of the prophets, prophets deal with political issues, kings, rogue kings, political figures. But God is measuring while all of this is going on where the church stands, where you are in this. Measuring your, those three things. Measuring the temple of God, the altar of God, and your worship of God. So we know that's taken place in the time of the prophets. The time of the prophets is in the time of measuring to give God's people what they have coming to them. See, you have to remember something. In the, in the time of prophets, a lot of people never see this. Nathan coming in to talk to David revealed a glaring role of a prophet. David had committed a, a, a sin, and he had done something by having one of his mighty men killed so he could take his wife. And when he did that, he had gotten pregnant while his mighty man was at war. It was the time kings go to war and David didn't go to war. And that's what got him into that. So when he had Uriah killed, there's nobody could buck the king. David was the king. And especially when he's a king that everybody says, you know, that he was a man after God's own heart. What are you going to say to the man? So nobody was talking. If anybody knew it, they sure wasn't whispering it. But Nathan the prophet, he heard it. And he went in and told David the story about the two men in his kingdom who had these sheep. One had a little ewe lamb that he treated like a daughter, let her eat at his table. The other man had many flocks and herds. But when the rich man who had many had a visitor come, he didn't kill one of his sheep to feed him. He slaughtered the man, the poor man's little one ewe lamb. David was furious. Who is the man? He ought to die. I want, he's going to die, pay back fourfold. Who is he? And Nathan looked at him and said, thou art the man. You're the man. The prophet in private with the king said, you're the man. God would have given you anything. 
He gave you wives. He gave you all that your heart desired. If you'd have wanted more, Nathan said, he would have given it to you. He said he would have given you such and such. It says such and such. The such and such I heard taught could have been the temple. He would have let him build it. But it cost him that. But my point being is Nathan brought the court of heaven into the halls of the king because no one could buck the king. It had to be tried from heaven. And so God, an officer of the court, a prophet, brought the court of Jehovah into the realm of men and men were being tried there. That's, the, that's the, one of the roles of a prophet. And it happens in the time of measuring. The church is being measured the temple's being measured. And we got people, you know, they were talking the other day. And Robin was talking to me about, you know, I don't have Facebook. I, I can't see Facebook. Don't even know how to get on my Facebook. And then they canceled me anyway for preaching about, uh, they said one of the reasons was, was animal sacrifice in a religious setting, which is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, the sacrifice of Isaac. So I don't know how to get on Facebook. I pull up my Facebook. I don't even know the password to get on it. There's a bunch of fake Facebooks about me. And they say they're me. They say they're me. I don't even have one. And they're sending it out to people. Beloved. Beloved of God. Show my picture. I don't talk that way. If you hadn't gathered that, I don't talk that way. Somebody sent Krista one from my fake Facebook, I guess it was. Was it a fake Facebook? Yeah, they sent Krista one from a fake Facebook and said, beloved child or whatever it was. <laughs> However they said it, I don't know how they said it. Krista said, Dad, why didn't you tell me you said that? <laughs> yeah, she said, you could have texted me. I don't have a Facebook. So when you see something from me on Facebook, please don't think that's me. That's some perverted Somebody who just wants money. <coughs> Somebody hand me some water, would you? <clears throat> daily prophetic word. A daily prophetic word? I don't give daily prophetic words. I can't give a prophetic word unless the Lord gives me one. So all this stuff about, thanks Austin, all this stuff about, we're going to send a, Here's a daily prophetic word. Would you like to hear a prophecy from the Lord? Well, that should be your answer when somebody says that. Send an offering, I'll give you a prophecy from the Lord. The first thing you do is say, mm-mm, 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 because -mm, prophecy is not for sale. And so it's not me, folks. I, I'm, I'm going on about that because it's not me. So don't, don't be fooled by that. I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway, the prophet brings the court of the Lord into the earth. As an officer of the court, it's not the prophet that's judging. He just brings the statutes and makes them known to the, to the officials. And the officials are the ones that God is judging. See, right now, the, the court of Jehovah is going through the earth. I don't know whether you know that or not, but it is. And right now, the temple of God is being measured. The altar of God is being measured. And the worship of God is being measured. That's a sobering thought. But the court and the outer court's not being measured. God is trying them to see whatever judgment they pass down, like David passed down on this, on this man Nathan told him of. David was being judged by his own judgment. See, people get the idea, you forget which. You forget that it's not Donald Trump on trial. Well, it sure looks like it. Well, a lot of things look like it. But it's not him that's being tried. It's you. All of you that are uh, uh, racking up bogus things against him, against a God's David, you're, you're absolutely being tried. 
You're being tried and exposed because what measure you're judging at him. God's not measuring you. You're measuring you. Whatever you say, it's not me that's on trial. Well, the prophet on trial, prophet. Brother Robin, you know, he said, no, whatever you, I'm not the one being judged here on trial. I brought the, as an obedient prophet, I just brought the statutes of the court of heaven. And whatever you do, God is trying those. That's a sobering thought. But it should be a sobering thought to the body of Christ that you're being measured. The temple of God is measured in the time of the prophets. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It's not that Revelation 11 has happened yet, but it is the time when prophets are in the earth. When prophets are spotlighted, these things are happening. It's a time of measuring, a time of bringing the court of God into the earth. The court of Jehovah. The time of the prophets is in the time of measuring to give to God's people what they have coming to them. At the time, the court is being desecrated by those who do not have a covenant with God. And you can see that out of New York. Even in the natural courts, they're just desecrating it. There's nothing justice or holy about it anymore. It's just, you know, whoever's shacking up with whoever gets the position now. In Revelation 11, it is a time that a one-world global government is trying to push its way into the earth. Now think of that. So in the time prophets are spotlighted, and there's a one-world global globalist government trying to push its way in, just like in Revelation 11. Look at all the things that are happening here. <clears throat> but the prophecies of the prophet holds the beast in the pit <clears throat> for three and a half years. This three and a half years is highly sought after by the devil. Now, in Daniel's time, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, he tells us this. And he, <clears throat> talking about the man of sin, and so forth. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. The saints are being measured. We wear out the saints of the Most High, and they shall and think and he and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until time and times and dividing of times, three and a half years, forty two months. The tribulation period is a time of global government. Don't forget that. It's a time of global government that ends up with one leader over it. A one world government and the time is seven years of the tribulation. However, only the last seven is really called the great tribulation. It's these first three and a half years the enemy seeks so badly. But the prophets keep it from his hands. Noah Harari, the false prophet of the WEF, just said that, and he, I realize, well, he don't call himself a prophet. No, but others do. Just said that it is likely that Donald Trump will be elected again. And if he, if he is, it will be kind of a death blow, he said, to the global agenda they have set up so far. And then he goes on to say, and he's talking about it openly, like we all want this global agenda. Matthew 24 declares this. Let me give you a little different view of this, maybe. That the time of the tribulation would have to be cut short or no flesh would be saved. People seem to think that it stopped early. But think of it this way. It's cut short because the enemy couldn't get his hands on those first three and a half years like he wanted to. If he could get them, no flesh would be saved. A globalist agenda is a horrible thing. It sets the stage for the beast to rise from the bottomless pit and do all the things in Scripture, like issuing a mark, 
uh, on the right hand or the foreheads that without it no man might buy or sell. Then he makes it mandatory that whoever will not take the mark will be put to death. The prophets in Revelation 11 are the resistance to the agenda, to this agenda. They'll set it up in their day in Revelation 11, but the beast himself is held in the pit until their prophecies are finished. Instead of condemning the prophets today, you should be thanking God Almighty for them. Or the beast would come before his time. Now, I realize Revelation 11 hasn't happened yet, so people's going to try to snag this. They try to use their stupid algorithms to grab something out of a message and put it together, and they'll take a, a line from here, here, and over yonder and put it all together, and it looks something stupid like uh, Robin D. Bullock says beast, uh, uh, beast, um, court system, uh, uh, the big toe aching, uh, whatever. If I mentioned it anywhere in it, they grab it. I realize Revelation 11 is not now, but it reveals to us what goes on in the time of prophets and gives you a mindset, an idea of what's in their minds. <clears throat> so instead of condemning the prophets today, you should be thanking God Almighty for them or the beast would come before his time. A prophet thinks like a warrior. Notice in this Revelation 11, during this time, it says power is given unto the prophets to prophesy three and a half years. It's that three and a half years. <clears throat> if Satan could get that, if he could get that in his hands and have full power during that, no flesh would be saved, I believe. Man, I don't know if that's all Matthew 24 means. I didn't say it was all it means. But if it's cut, time is cut short. If he can't get that three and a half years, he's short. I hope you can see that. The prophets prophesied three and a half years in sackcloth and ashes for repentance. They begin to tell the world, repent, repent. Why are the temples being measured? Repent. <clears throat> In Revelation 11, it tells us they stand before the God of the earth. That means they know they're on a mission. They know what their mission, they know what they're doing with it. It says, if any man tries to willingly injure them, fire will proceed out of their mouths. This must be their prophecies coming out. Or in the tribulation, it could be literal a scorching fire. But the prophecies that come out of their mouth, they cannot be overcome. It will incinerate those, and they will be slaughtered, the Bible says. The prophets have brought the court of heaven into the earth as officers of the court so that God may judge in the earth. Right now, it is not Donald Trump on trial, as we said. It's those that are judging him. It's not the prophets that are on trial. It's those that are judging them. Their authority in Revelation 11, notice this in this time, is turned up in their prophecies to the point that it don't rain in those days except by their prophecies. They have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Prophets believe that there's nothing impossible with God. They will prophesy no rain, and it'll not rain. They'll prophesy water to blood, it'll be. They know that their prophecies are keeping the beast of the bottomless pit from coming upon the earth. And right now, they're trying to push this agenda in on us before it's time. There's a billion soul harvest to come in yet. There's times of of prophecies that have gone forth like Bob Jones' prophecy of a billion souls. There's times of prophecies that, that I've given, others have given, prophecies been given out. Kim Clement gave prophecies given out that they cannot, and those who would seek to make those prophecies not come to pass, it's like a fire incinerating them. They cannot stop those words. He said, well, you know, the prophecy of the president. Now, look, we've already been over that. But here is the deal. If Donald Trump was not the rightful president recognized by heaven, why don't this thing just go away? 
How come it won't go away? And how come they're willing to do anything to get rid of him? Anything. Why? If it's not so, it's because they're withstanding the prophet's words and they're trying to do it and it's incinerating them. It's just bringing them to ashes. Because you cannot overcome that. Just like when Jacob prophesied over Benjamin. You can't overcome that. It was given in a prophecy of God. Even though it was tried. The prophecy of Benjamin actually prophesied that Benjamin would be the first. They were, the first king would come from his line. But then there would be a substitute from Judah. And when it came time for the substitute. The, the guy from Benjamin saw he didn't want to give it up. And there was a war, even though the prophet Samuel said, you don't have the kingdom anymore, hoss. Would you call Samuel a false prophet? No, you didn't understand what he meant. You rewrote the prophecy in your own image on what you thought it should say. But God meant what he said when he said it. David had the kingdom the moment Samuel said he did. But the one occupying the throne did not want to give that up. They know that their prophecies are keeping the beast out of the bottomless pit from in the bottomless pit from coming upon the earth. They know that they're keeping a globalist agenda from taking over. They are the resistance of the whole thing. And that's some of the mindset and times of a prophet. The time of measuring the temple the altar, the worship, the time to bring the courts of heaven into the earth so that God may try men, the time that powers turned up in the prophecies. I mean, we're, we hear prophecies given out that's just glaring what would happen, and then they happen. I mean, prophecies even down to the minutest detail of um, it'll rain fish. And it did. It rained fish. You're talking about prophecies that God gave. You're talking about prophecies that can't be overcome. We need to start getting our mind wrapped around this. You're talking about that Suez boat, right? When the Lord gave me that word. And said there would be a miracle in a ship, and that and it began, and he gave the word, and then start talking about this ship, and then this giant freighter gets stuck in the Suez Canal. And he said, and, and I remember hearing a conversation about two guys. There were two guys talking. One didn't have uh, much hair, and but he he was. I could see his clothes. I could see his look. And they were talking about him. One said, what do we do now? And the other one said, let's throw him Carey. John Carey, he's no good to us anymore. Throw him out there. I gave the prophetic word because the Lord said, give it. Like Elisha would hear conversations in the king's bedchamber. And then I gave the word. And I think it was 21 days later, something like that, it hit the news. That John Kerry, they wanted to try him for treason for talking to these two guys. One of them was the head of Iran or something, Iraq. I don't know who it was. But he was having a conversation with them, giving, talking about Israel. And suddenly he was out there. He was thrown to the wolves for it. Then you get prophecies like in 2016, there's a sickness coming to the earth, the Lord told me. In 2016 said there's a sickness coming to the earth. It will make the nations tremble. And it's a harvest for the children of the wicked one. The Lord told what it was coming for. And then in 2019, the Lord gave me the word, there's coming a, 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 a sickness, a plague of some kind on the earth, a pestilence. Robin said, a, an epidemic maybe. I said, yes, maybe an epidemic. I didn't know the word pandemic. And then sure enough, it came exactly like that. You see all kinds of prophecies. Not long ago, the Lord gave me a word that there would be a, <clears throat> a collision time was coming. A collision in all of this 
political realm. I told it on Flashpoint. No, it wasn't Flashpoint. Where was it? Maybe it was. Victory Thon. I gave it there when I was asked. Gene Bailey asked me, he said, what do you see coming? I said, a collision's coming. And I talked about this collision. I didn't know why, but before the sickness came on the earth, I would go up to the podium and say, everything you know is about to change. Everything you know is about to change. It'll never go back to the way it was. And I'd leave the podium saying, what is going to change, Lord? <clears throat> and then that pandemic, everything changed. And when I said a collision's coming, I just kept talking about thinking, what is a collision? What? And then I, I think it was somebody was talking to Tucker Carlson, and, and that one of them asked the other, <clears throat> what's happening? What's about to happen? They said, a collision. <clears throat> a collision's about to happen. It's a collision time. Little things along. I was talking to somebody when I heard tanks rolling up on the Israeli border. Way before this happened, I heard it in the spirit and told it that it was coming. I never put it public at that time. I told who needed to hear it and rolling up on the, and, and it was in peacetime. And then I was, I'm in Israel on Mount Carmel prophesying a war that was coming in Israel's deliverance. On Masada prophesying a war that was coming in Israel's deliverance in uh, in. Where on the Syrian border I was prophesying, and all of this in peacetime. And it wasn't two months later. It wasn't peacetime no more. And on Mount Carmel, I said, there's going to be a birds of prey. Birds of prey will come. I thought I was speaking of drones. And it turned out that Hamas came in on paragliders. Paragliders like birds out of the sky with machine gunners on the front, killing those people, unarmed people, coming across the border like birds of prey. All of these prophecies, one after another after another, things that prophesied, and I can't speak for every ministry, but I can this one. Prophesied, 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 hitting it, boom, 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 hitting it, hitting, and then we missed it on the election. The same voice that told me all the other things told me this too. I remember when a major prophetic uh, host of a prophetic program asked me on the phone, not in public, on the phone said, do you think Donald Trump will win the election? I got quiet for a moment and listened in my spirit. And then I answered this out of my spirit. You don't just get, you don't jump to answer out of your head. I said, yes, I do. I said, whether anyone else knows it or not, I'm not sure yet. That came right out of my spirit. Nobody thought of what happened. And that's, that was my answer. You think about it. You say, well, you, you prophesied he, <clears throat> he would win. I, I don't know that I have a prophecy of that on the air. I said it like I just told you. But I did hear the Lord say. I looked at the television <clears throat> And Joe Biden was speaking. I said, Lord, he don't need to be president. The Lord said he won't. Yeah, but he's in office. I didn't say he wouldn't be in office. I said he won't be the president. The time of two kings, Saul, David, David, Saul. Oh, I don't know, Brother Robin. <clears throat> you know, you prophets, we need to just, the, well, I appreciate you even admitted that I am one. Because I've, it's been said so many times I wasn't by people who are not prophets. But at least if you, will, if you will listen and look at God as supernatural, not just in control. Paul told Timothy over a prophecy, he said, war over the prophecy. Fight for it. Contend for it. 
That's what has to happen. Prophecy is the intent of the written word. Given into the earth in, in everyday speech, it's brought into the domain of men. The only reason men don't understand it is because they're so far removed from the articles of the covenant that God has made with them. So this is, this is where we are today. It's the time of the prophet. It's the time of measuring. It's the time of the court of heaven being brought into the earth. It's the time. I'm speaking of spiritual matters. Hallelujah. And if we're, not, if we're not going to look at the spirit, and we're not going to start looking at spiritual matters, we're going to stay in the soulless realm. And you'll start prophesying or interpreting prophecy by the anguish or the happiness of your soul, wherever it is at the moment. Hallelujah. Well, I guess that's all today. That's, uh, that's uh, what the Lord had told me to share today on the 11th hour, so I did. And um, we're in collision points in the political realm. Everything's happening around. But know this. God is moving. Prophets are speaking. And what's in the mind of a prophet is they know they're the resistance of a global agenda. They know they brought the court of heaven into the earth. Maybe they know that. If they didn't, they do now. And they know they're on a mission, if nothing else, from God. So they speak boldly as if they're not afraid of anything. They just speak it. because And everyone that tries to dampen the prophecy and try to make the prophecy not come to pass, it's like a fire that incinerates them. It cannot be overcome until the prophecies are finished. What that means is until they come to pass, they got to happen. And the prophecies that are being given now will carry us all the way to the catching away of the church. Remember that. The prophecies, if those two prophets in Revelation 11 didn't prophesy for those three and a half years, there would be no path of light to carry through to the end of the tribulation. When God begins a thing, he ends it. So we're prophesying now, prophesying now of tomorrow, prophesying now in the future, prophesying now, and it will be a path of light that will carry us all the way to the rapture of the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, <clears throat> come on, Krista, and receive our offering today. And we're going to hear how to prosper today. You know, God wants you to prosper. He don't, want, he don't want you and I to be broke in the earth. You know, he don't want you to be woke and broke. Woke equals broke. Ask New York if woke doesn't equal broke. Hallelujah. But God's system never fails. Seed, plant, harvest. Amen. Amen. Mr. You know, I was, I was thinking about uh, some of this, I need to, there's a prophecy that I need to give. I'm, I've got to find it. But I want you to know something. That in, in everything that's happening, in the time of the prophets and so forth, you need to remember that it's the time of measuring. And I don't know, that got real serious, more serious in my thinking. That's the time of measuring that we covered. It's when the temple is measured, the altar is measured, and the worship is measured, those that worship in it. So it's the time to give out to the temple of God and, and everything to meet out what you've been waiting on. <clears throat> and those of you that try to, uh, I don't know if the word stymie is right, but the word, you, you try to, to quell the, 
the blessing of the Lord. You try to stop it. You try to talk somebody out of the supernatural. And in the time of, of measuring is the time when God is wanting to give what they have coming to them. But if they're talked out of it and, they're, and the temple is defiled and the altar, the sacrifice that they put on the altar is defiled, <clears throat> and their worship is not pure, then what, uh, what's going to be measured to them? They'll come up short. And people, you know, it's just like it was, there was one uh, man, I, I believe it was, um, I, I don't want to say who it was, but somebody came and they asked their pastor, they showed him in the Bible, said, the Lord says that we can raise the dead. Is this true? Can you do that, Pastor? <clears throat> and the pastor looked at him and said, No, I can't, but you can. That pastor had enough sense to know that just because I don't have the faith for it don't mean you can't do it. <clears throat> Instead of trying to tell people all of this stuff is not real anymore and that it's all passed away with the last apostle and all of this kind of stuff, you put them in a bad place for the time of measuring. You've put them in a real bad place, teach that the prophets are not real and this and that. Knowing that the prophets, the office of a prophet is what's holding a one world globalist agenda off of their back. And still you try to say the prophets have to be vetted by you and your arrogance. And you just put them in a place of measuring where they're going to be measured short. This is serious stuff. <clears throat> And so we have to be, you need to repent of that if you put people in that position. You know, I remember a story of John G. Lake. John G. Lake was one of my heroes. You know, I, I studied after him so much. And John Lake was, <clears throat> he was just like an apostle of, to Africa. I mean, man, we're talking about one of the most powerful men of God we've ever known. <clears throat> and he he had a people he had taught that had grew up under him. And he went into this tent, not not tent, it was a hut. And the hut was down low. You had to get down and crawl into it. And it was so full of smoke. And he had, where they would try to, you know, keep a fire in it, I think, and so forth. So anyway, he goes into it because him and one of his, I think his name was Let Wabi, was, was the guy, one of his uh, that he was a mentor to. And so they went inside this hut and there was a baby inside that had broken its neck and it was dead. And you could take the baby and just lay its head over to the side like that. It was broken. And I think if I pronounce it right, uh, let Wabi, he, he looked at Brother Lake and he said, but this is no problem for Jesus, is it, Brother Lake? And John Lake said, I, I said, I'm going to go up on that mountain and pray. You stay here with the baby and you pray. And he said, because I knew I didn't have the faith for a broken neck, but he did. He did. So I wasn't going to hinder his faith. And so he went up on that mountain and prayed all night. And the next morning he came back down and the, and he was just smiling. He said, what about the baby? What about the baby? <clears throat> and they picked up the baby well and whole and brought him out. See, just because you couldn't do it don't mean you hinder someone else from doing it that has the faith to do it. You're putting them in a bad spot for measurement. And you start teaching them. It's like one guy come down the road one young man in his Bible was just very thin. He had just a little thin Bible. I mean, just way down like that. And he said, well, the pastor said, what you got there? He said, well, it's my Bible. He said, that's your Bible? It's very thin. He said, well, yeah, when I, when I went through it and cut out all the things you said wasn't for us, and this is what's left. You put that boy in a bad place for measuring 
Because God can only get something to you according to the measurement of the temple, according to the measurement of the altar, according to the measurement of your worship. And so that you put them in a bad place for measurement. And so don't do that. If you can't get it and you don't know it, that don't mean it's ungettable. And that don't mean it's unknowable. It just means you don't know it or you can't get it. But don't hinder them because they'll walk right up with it in their hands and you'll wonder, how did you get that? Well, I just took God at his word and believed it. I believed the prophets, so I prospered. There's people come against the prophets so hard that absolutely they, they have made the, the body of Christ, they put them in a bad place for measurement because they just started turning away from every prophet. Do you know the seriousness of what you've done, especially in this time? So I was sitting over there thinking about that. And we need to, we honestly need to, we need to think on these things. Now, <clears throat> I want to, if I can find this prophecy I want to give it to you, uh, at least say it, if I can get it said. And this is what the Lord said to me the, the other day, and I haven't given it on, on any other program. He said, the cruelty of man has not yet been seen. What they will try and implement in the coming days will be the cruelest yet. There's an agenda, I'll say it again, the cruelty of man has not yet been seen. What they will try to implement in the coming days and, and however long that is will be the cruelest yet. Because we're in a time when prophecy has been fought on every corner. It's being fought on every corner. Saul trying to keep David away from the throne. This happening, that happening, trying to bring in a global agenda. Harari, uh, Noah Harari panicking over Donald Trump could win. It's most likely he will be elected. If he does, it'll be the death blow to what we've built up on this global agenda. Well, let it die. So they're not going to lay down without a fight. They opened the temple, the, the, they... They recreated the ceremony of Pan to open the gates of hell and the Gothard portal back in 16 and went before the pandemic and brought Pan up. Think about all of that. And all of this stuff, they <clears throat> CERN built on trying to open a dimension on the temple of Apollo with the god Shiva, the false god Shiva, the god of destruction uh, outside the the place there, the WHO met with the Chinese and had a, a, a before the pandemic, and I think it's 2017, had Shiva sitting on the table. They have worked hard to build this thing up to a place. They're not going to lay down with it. So the Lord said, the cruelty of man has not yet been seen. He said, what they're going to try to implement in the coming days will be the cruelest yet. So we need to get our temples in a place to really where when it's measured, it's the Lord can say, have you seen him or you seen her? And then the altar, when we, we pray, we offer whatever we're doing, our sacrifice of praise, the place of the altar is measured. What is that in your life? And then your worship. Worship steals the enemy and the avenger. Worship, when the body of Christ begins to show itself in this way, then victory is assured in every area. So don't, don't try to stop men and women from doing that. Don't try to. We're in a time. We're dealing with time. And we're looking into, the, into time, the future and time and, and where we are and what's going on. Believe the supernatural. Just believe God is supernatural. Hallelujah. Well, 
It's been a good 11th hour today. We've, <clears throat> we've, uh, we've heard some things. I hope we've learned some things. Uh, the music was new. We, we did some new music today as the Lord gave it to us. But I don't want to close the program today without giving you an opportunity to be born again. You need to be born again. Nothing works for you in the Scripture uh, if, if you're not born again. You need, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And yes, God can heal you, and, and he heal, everybody he healed in the, in the New Testament uh, before he died and rose again, they were all lost. He healed them all. Oh, yeah, he can do it. But you know, if he heals you, the least you can do is get saved. If he's blessed you, the least you can do is get saved. You know, I... Uh, <clears throat> I remember I was in a meeting one time and, and they had this prayer line lined up across the front and I was praying for the sick and they were, miracles were happening. This little boy was there and something was wrong with him. I don't know, he's 11, 12 years old maybe. And his eyes somehow, his motor skills didn't work with his hands. I mean, he, he could say tie his shoe, but his hands wouldn't do it. And I don't know what they call that, but he couldn't do it or fix his belt or anything. He just wouldn't connect. So I prayed for him, and the Lord healed him, and he could instantly he could just do things. And I said, are you saved, son? No. I said, well, the Lord healed you. The least you could do is get saved. Yeah. So he received Jesus. You know, so you, you God is, he'll do things, but. I know this guy, you know, back in B.C. days, I played music. That was my living. I played music and for a lot of years. And, and I remember this owner of this, this joint we played in, he would come up at night now. This is what he'd do on Saturday night. We was all lost as a ball in high weeds, you know. We knew God. We, we were scared of him, <laughs> you know. I stayed under conviction so much, I don't even know how, because I got saved when I was nine, and he just never left me alone. And then one day, I was alone, and I'll never forget that. That's another story. But this guy used to come up, and he was, he was kind of one of the owners his daughter and her husband owned it. But he was he just kind of did what he wanted. He was the, you know, the older man. And he'd come up and he'd get ready to leave on a Saturday night. I'll never forget it, man. He'd have his drink in his hand. He'd come up and he'd be doing like this. That's the way he walked. <laughs> I said, where are you going, man? He said, I got to go. I got to get up and be at church in the morning. I said, you go to church? He said, absolutely. He said, hey, laugh at me if you want. He said, but I got to go get, listen to this, Krista, I got to go get my tie then. I said, I'm just looking at him. He said, hey, laugh if you want, but it works. It works. Now, he's lost, given his tithes, and he's being blessed because it works. Well, a lot of lost people are getting rich off of the principles that the church won't do because they're built into the earth to work. The earth brings forth fruit of itself, you know. And years later, I saw the same man, born again, singing gospel music with a group of his own. It was amazing. And I was in church, and he was in church. That was amazing. So... Today, some of you look and say, the Lord's blessed me. I don't serve him, but he's blessed me. He's healed me, and I don't serve him. Well, you know, you ought at least serve him. So why don't you make Jesus the Lord of your life? You know, it's like that girl told, uh, I don't know if it was Brother Hagin told her, said, I don't want to get saved, Brother Hagin, because I'll have to quit dancing. I'll have to quit going to the dance. He said, oh, no, go on and get saved. You can dance all you want. You can do all that. You can keep going, do all you want. You can do that. She said, what? He said, oh, yeah, go ahead, just get saved. Then just do it all you want. She got saved, and she looked at him and said, came back later and said, oh, you knew, you, you knew what you were doing. Said, when I got saved, you knew I don't want to go over there no more. 
I don't want to now. Well, a lot of things change when you get saved. You have a higher call. You want to do something higher. And the Lord may send you right back over there to witness and be a witness. I don't know. But won't you just get saved? Paul said, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth he's your Lord, you'll be saved. So why don't you do that? For with the heart man believes and to the mouth a confession is made into salvation with your mouth. So why don't you go ahead and get saved? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are now my Lord and personal Savior. Live in my heart. Cleanse me of all sin, unrighteousness, and a sin consciousness. Lord, for whatever you want me to do from here on out, I will do. Hallelujah. Yeah, and you, just, you can stand there in front of him and just say, forgive me, Lord, and he will. He'll just wipe it away and then say, come on, let's go now. You're a brand new creature. You never existed before. And if you've done that, then welcome to the family because you just became a child of God. Don't stop there. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Man, and then just say, thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it. And then whatever sounds you hear, just begin to let them out of your mouth. The Holy Ghost lives in you. It's going to come up on you now. And just start saying, Just start saying whatever sounds you hear. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost taking hold together with you against your infirmities. And he pray for things that you don't even know. Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember. And, you know, go to the website, Robin D. Bullock, and look for that little booklet, Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. Download it free. And if you can't do that, write to us and we'll mail you one free. Especially you just got saved. Amen. Till next time we gather together right here around God's word, remember this, never forget, Jesus loves you with everything in him. He stretched his hands out as wide as he could and died for you. He rose again after three days and nights for you. He loves you. and We love you. And never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom and shalom.